So the bird integument is what we're going to talk about today. The integument of an animal includes the area of contact between the organism and its surrounding environment. So that would include things like the skin and all its specializations, feathers, wattles, beaks, claws, dermal muscles, nerve endings, even the oil gland. And we considered a few specializations of the integument last week uh, in the lab on uh, topography, like the wattles, beak scales, claws, brood patches, uropygial gland. But this week what we want to concentrate on is feathers, one component of the integument. Now remember, uh, feathers are a synapomorphic trait that all birds together share, you know, along with a bunch of extinct dinosaur groups. So feathers alone distinguish birds from all other living animals. Now because of elongated scales, because they may have uh, been found in non-flying dinosaurs, feathers probably evolved primarily as either a communication or insulating uh, function for endothermic, you know, as it be begin to evolve warm-bloodedness. Whatever their origin, feathers are the best insulating material we've ever known. Muscles at the bases of feathers allow them to be fluffed so that rates of heat exchange can be reduced considerably. They're also incredibly strong and remarkably light, so they make unbeatable airfoils as well. Now let's talk about feather types. They're basically five main feather types. Contour feathers, semi-plumes, down feathers, philoplumes, and bristles. And you'll be able to look at each of these types under microscopes in the lab. And the microscopic structure of any of these types differs uh, in predictable fashion among species. So I'll talk about how you can distinguish the five different types after we learn some basic feather parts here. Let's just look at the structure of a typical contour feather. Macroscopically, these feathers have a main shaft right down the middle which consists of two parts, the calamus or quill, okay, that's the part that doesn't have any feather veins attached, and then the rachis, which has feather veins attached. The calamus or quill is hollow for the most part, and the rachis is not. Now the inner or trailing edge on an extended wing, the inner vein, and there's an outer vein, which would be on the leading edge of an extended wing primary. So two veins, inner and outer, basically. Okay, the thinner one is the outer, the bigger, uh, broader one is the inner vein. So the rachis has anteroposterior flexibility. So it's flexible from the anterior to the posterior. You can, you can bend the feather fore and aft, but it has dorsoventral rigidity. In other words, it's very rigid. Uh, if you try to bend it up and down, it's very difficult to do because of the combined ventral groove, that groove all the way down the rachis on the bottom, and cortical ridges that grow down into the pithy part of the feather um, in the rachis. So those combined features make it like an I-beam, so you can bend it uh, fore and aft, but you can't bend it up and down. Now let's take a look at the uh, barbs. So these veins, each vein, the broader trailing vein and the narrower leading edge vein, are, they consist of barbs. Okay, so barbs come off the rachis. Each barb has a central shaft called the ramus, okay, and the parallel rami or rami are held together because each barb has barbules. So now we have a barb and then you have barbules. Some of the barbules point out toward the tip of the feather. Those are the distal barbules and some point toward the base of the feather. Those are the proximal barbules, okay? So what's going to be really cool when you look at the structure of these under a microscope you can see that the distal barbules, the ones that point toward the tip of the feather, have little hooks or hooklets. And the ones that point toward the base of the feather um, are kind of comma-shaped and, and get hooked by the hooklets and the distal barbules. Here, I'll show you another look here. So we're, we have a feather shaft on top. It's pointing toward the tip of the feather to the right. Okay, So the distal barbules are pointing out toward the tip, you see and they have hooklets, okay? And the 
proximal barbules pointing toward the base of the feather um, are comma-shaped. Look at this at the bottom. They give a nice little backwards comma there. So the hooklets hook over that comma, right? And you might say, well, why don't they just slip off the end of those proximal barbules? What keeps them from slipping off the end are, notice the tips of the proximal barbules are these little uh, barbicels. So the proximal barbules have barbicels or little knobs or upward flanges, and the distal barbs, barbules have hooklets. So that's how you can tell the two barbules apart. This is like better than Velcro. Take a look under the microscope and you, and you see how the distal barbules have little hooklets. Just amazing. Here's a picture of a chucker, adult on the left, juvenile on the right. You can see the adult has well-developed uh, distal barbules with hooklets. The juvenile feather is not. It's really fluffy. Okay, so the adult structure, basically, the feather is held together, the, the barbs are held together by these structures, okay, and making for a very tight platform. So we talked about birds preening in their uropygial gland. Now here is a rock pigeon superimposed onto a blow-up of a feather, and the feather lice on the feather from uh, Clayton's lab at the University of Utah. This pigeon's preening out feather lice with its beak. It's important to preen and keep feathers in good condition and it, because of the appearance, and because of flight functions, thermal regulation, all these depend on feather condition. And what, what Clayton showed is that bird beaks are even kind of have a little noticeable overhang and he thinks that um, has evolved to facilitate the removal of lice and other things on the feather. In fact, what he did in the lab was file the upper mandible down to see if they were then less effective at get, getting rid of lice. And indeed, here are the real data. So you can see the, the blue beak on the bottom there has a filed, it's filed, whereas the uh, orange triangle, it's not filed. And after 20 weeks, the differences in number of lice are you know, highly significant. So feather care is a big deal. Now. Now that we know some parts of the feather, let's look at the feather types. You can tell five different feather types based on the parts that they have and, and the proportions and that kind of thing. So a contour feather has a long rachis, right? The rachis is longer than any one of the barbs. It has barbules on the barbs, and the barbules have hooklets, so they are hooked together, just like Velcro, right? You can pull them apart, and then you can uh, preen it right back together again. So you can unzip it and zip it. Um, a semi-plume is pretty much in terms of shape, just like the contour feather. But notice that there's no hooklets or barbicels on the barbules, so they aren't linked together in parallel fashion. That's much more fluffy looking. Then there's a down feather. Down feathers Basically, it's hard to even find a rachis. If there's one there, it's way, way, way shorter than any one of the barbs. So all the barbs are kind of flailing out all over the place, and they're not hooked to each other. There's no hooklets. So that's a down feather. Philoplume. A philoplume has a long rachis, and the only place the barbs occur are the very tip, okay, like a little feather duster. And then bristles, it's the opposite. You still have a long rachis, but the only barbs that are present are at the base or very proximal. So there's the five different kinds of feathers. Now, what we want to do is talk a little more about uh, the functions of these five feathers and a little more about features unique to each type of feather. So let's go back to the contour, start with our contours. Now remember, these include most of the feathers that form the contour, hence the name, or outline of a bird. These are all the exposed feathers. The function of contour feathers is certainly related to coloration, you know, appearance, but flight, insulation. So all these things are very important functions of contour feathers. Now contour feathers, turns out, don't grow from all parts of the body, but they grow in well-defined terally. Okay, so here's a little picture of uh, six or eight feather tracts or terally the humeral along the humerus, the alar, ventral, femoral, crural. So you can, 
you can see the different tracks, and these are the only places that contour feathers grow. There are places where they don't grow, and those are called apteria. So you have pterile and apteria. The pterile have contour feathers, apteria do not. Special kinds of contour feathers um, are flight feathers, of course, and the flight feathers of the wing are called remiges. The flight feathers of the tail are called rectrices. All right, usually six pairs of rectrices. The outermost flight feathers of the wing of the remiges usually have uh, webs of unequal width, right? While body contour feathers and the innermost flight feathers have webs of equal width. And we talked about this in class and why an unequal width would make sense for the most outermost uh, flight feathers. Now there's four kinds of remiges. There's primaries, so the flight feathers, secondaries, tertiaries or tertials, and the allula. The primaries are asymmetrical feathers, many of them attached to the manis or hand. Okay, They're 9 to 12 in number in, uh, for flying birds. Most passerines, uh, the, the passeriformes, have 9, you know, but things like herons and ducks have 11. Flightless birds are really variable in terms of the number of primaries, all the way from 3 in a cassowary to 16 in an ostrich. Now, primaries are usually counted from the inside outward. And this is because feathers gained or lost during the course of evolution are always the distal ones. Therefore, if you want to have homologous numbering system, you number from the inside out. They also molt from the innermost to the outermost. So the first feather to molt of the primaries is the innermost, and then the second, and the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, all the way out to the end. Secondaries, on the other hand, are attached to the ulna, not to the manis or hand, but to the ulna. All right, and these number from 6 to 32, the number being related to the length of the forearm. So hummingbirds have relatively few, six secondaries, and albatrosses have a lot, like 32. And the secondaries are numbered, notice, from the outside inward, and they molt that same way, okay? The tertiaries or tertials, uh, are the innermost three or so secondaries. They're actually, depending on who you, who you read, they're either secondaries um, or tertials. But they molt out a sequence, and so that's why a different name is given to these feathers. Also, they come out of the brachium, the area between the elbow and the trunk. So people consider that to be a different group, tertials. Then finally, the allula is that little group of feathers borne by the pollux, or thumb, digit number one. Finally, in terms of the flight feathers, there are coverts, which cover these primary and secondary feathers and tertials. Um, they, this is true for the remiges and the rectrices, the wing and the tail feathers. They make the wing and tail aerodynamically stable. And there are several layers of coverts, usually greater, median, and lesser layers, right? against the tail and the wing flight feathers. Now there's some cool modifications of contour feathers, of the flight feathers and tail feathers. I'll just show you a couple of examples. One is that in ducks, geese, swans, grouse, turkeys, they have about the basal one-third or so of the inner or posterior vein of the remiges, okay, the flight feathers, the interior third or so of the posterior part, the trailing edge of that feather, greatly stiffened by the extension of the ventral ridge, the underside of the ramus on each barb. Remember, each barb has a ramus, that's the central shaft. And if you look at this under the microscope, it's really cool. You'll see that that, that ramus bends forward toward the next ramus in front of it. And so it's like an L shape. And, and so there's no air that can get up through that feather on the down stroke of flight, whereas on the upstroke, it's another one of these cases where air can probably seep through a little bit, so it's a, like a mini Venetian blind again. And it's thought to be there for aerodynamic reasons because these are birds that are at near the upper limit of uh, body mass in terms of you know wing loading. Now the entire series of overlapping flaps makes a very smooth, shiny-looking uh, area on the wing called the tegmen. Here's another couple of cool modifications. One of the wing, see the woodcock, outermost 
primary feathers, look how tiny they are, oh my gosh, and it makes sound with those feathers, just like the snipe that we have here in Montana, the outermost tail for the feathers, the rectrices are modified and you hear it giving a display in the air in spring and that's this little that's the snipe with its tail feathers making that noise. Owls have amazing modifications in lecture. We talked about how smooth and fuzzy all the, the feathers were in owls, but there's also a neat comb-like anterior vein on the outermost primary. So the outermost forward primaries have this comb-like structure. And all these things are probably adaptations to reduce the owl's own noise from turbulence of the air to reduce interference with its own hearing ability. It's not that they're trying to be quiet so the prey can't hear them coming, it's so they can hear what the heck's going on because they hunt by listening. Then you can go on and on uh, with different kinds of modified contour feathers. Um, and here's a picture just showing a wild bunch. Uh, if you think about it, I suppose all feather types could be considered contours or contours that have become modified in some way. So, you know, feather types evolve from one another. But uh, most people recognize five categories, so we'll continue to uh, tell you about the other four here. So semi-plumes, that's our second one. Now remember, semi-plumes have barbules. They have barbs, but the barbules lack hooklets. Therefore, there's no interlocking barbs. The rachis is still longer than any barb. The function of these is primarily thermal insulation and to increase buoyancy in water birds, so they have lots of semi-plumes. Semi-plumes now grow out of the apteria, right? The undistinguished feather tracks, not out of the terile. So that's cool, and that's a difference between contour and semi-plume. Down feathers. Here, the rachis is either absent altogether or shorter than the longest barb. The barbules, again, lack hooklets. The function is certainly insulation, and they occur everywhere on the body, in the terile, and in the apteria. Some down feathers um, release powder, like baby powder, to dress feathers, and they're sometimes considered a distinct feather type. These powder down feathers grow continuously. That's kind of interesting. The only feather that does that, and they're never molted. The barbs at the tips constantly disintegrate into a talc-like powder, which is water resistant as well. So take a look at this uh, bittern Powder down feathers are really pronounced in herons, egrets, and bitterns in the family Ardeidae, and they're located usually on the breast and belly. See this yellowish feathers there? Those are powder down. Again, these are the only feather types growing continuously and, and that aren't molted. Philoplumes have long, bare shaft with a tuft of barbs at the tip. Their function is thought to be sensory since they occur by and large in tandem with contour feathers like one to two of these per contour. And they may receive information about the goings-on near the tips of the contour feathers and send this information to the dermal muscles controlling feather positions or something. You know, it's like how do, if you touch a bird and the feather's dead, how do they know they're being touched? Well, these are tactile things that may be sending uh, signals through nerve endings at their base. So um, they occur in terrily with the contour feathers. Finally, bristles are mostly rachis with barbs present proximally. So now near the base of the feather you have some barbs. Eyelashes are, usually, are actually bristles. Bristles are also found around the rictus, around the mouth, and they're called rictal bristles. Especially in flycatchers and night jars, these are really pronounced. And this suggests the function is somehow related to the act of flycatching. So there's this author, Stettenheim, who suggested, you know, four possible functions that could increase insect catching ability through funneling or could let birds hold big feisty beetles or grasshoppers which could slip away or might protect their eyes or they might have tactile function so they're flying through the air and they feel something and move their mouth really fast and capture it and increase uh, capture success. And it turns out Conover and Miller at Washington State brought flycatchers into the lab and filmed them catching insects in an aviary. Then they cut 
the little rictal bristles, right? And they found no effect of removal of the rictal bristles on insect capture frequency, so they're just as good at capturing the bugs. But there was a significant increase in the uh, number of times they were hit in the eye. So they suggested eye protection function is probably what's going on. Okay, let's consider how feathers grow. The skin basically has a dermal layer beneath. It's a nutrient tissue with blood vessels and underlies an epidermis above, right? And in feather formation, the dermis gives rise to the pulp inside the feather, which contains the nutrients for growth. Above the dermis, there's kind of three layers of epidermis. Okay, the, the innermost layer of epidermis is the site of the germinating ring. There's a ring of cells that germinate. They're just going through mitosis, putting out more and more and more cells. The intermediate layer gives rise to most of the feather proper, and the outermost epidermis gives rise to the calamus or quill. So, so you're growing basically from one point around the base toward one point on the other side and going up, pushing out that way. Um, I'll try to show you how this works and have a tiny little video too. Keratin production hardens the feather parts when the growth stops. Then the sheath covering all this begins to split at the tip and it disintegrates after the feather is fully hardened. Then the pulp on the inside of this circle is reabsorbed. Now once the feather is formed, it's dead keratinized structure. If it's lost, it'll be replaced any time of year, but it won't be replaced if you clip it because there's no signal that it's been lost. And pet owners, of course, take advantage of this and clip their little parakeet's wings to keep them from flying for at least half a year until they molt again. So here's a little picture showing how this growth occurs around this epidermal ring where the mitosis is going on. So see feathers, cells are migrating around from the V on the bottom toward the D on the top, ventral to dorsal. And then when they hit D, they're coming around both sides, they hit together, they got to go somewhere, so they push out, and that's where the rachis is, is forming. So push out farther, 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 and you can see how these things are becoming a rachis and the barbs. So you want to see a little video clip of this, check this out. Here comes growth of the feather. And you can't see what's going on beneath the sheath, but they try to draw it in here. It's hard for me to tell what's going on, but those are mostly um, barbs. They're pointing up. Barbs, 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 barbs. And then pretty soon around one point around that circle, you're going to get um, the rachis. Ventral barb ridge formation. It's hard, still hard to tell what's going on here. It's growing up, up, up. Oh, I see. It's they're all going around to the left side there. Left side, left side, left side. They're all going around to that one side. And then that pushes out. Push, 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 out, out, out. That's becoming the rachis. Up, 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 up. And there you can see the rachis now, the central shaft, and all the little barbs coming off. Cool, and voila, you've got your feather. The last thing consider is feather coloration. Feather color is due to either of two factors, chemical substances or physical properties of the feather structure. The two types of color are consequently referred to as chemical coloration or structural coloration. The chemical coloration results from pigments that absorb certain wavelengths of light and they reflect other wavelengths. Structural colors are formed by the interference of light waves producing iridescence, such as in a soap bubble, or scattering of shorter wavelengths of light by small particles within the feather. Basically, it's a structural thing and not chemical. So let's look at the different color types. Look at the left column first, red, orange, yellow. Carotenoids normally produce these colors. These are fat-soluble pigments occurring in a diffuse state in little fat droplets inside the feather proper. They're synthesized, you know, carotenoids are synthesized by plants and modified from ingested food. So your diet is going to affect, you know, your ability to mobilize these carotenoids. And they can generally be removed from feathers with organic solvents, right? Okay, how about black, gray, brown, tawny? These kind of things are produced by melanins. 
Melanins are insoluble pigments occurring as granules. They're synthesized by special pigment cells called melanocytes and from the amino acid tyrosine. The more melanin there is, the darker the color will be. Then you have green. Green's weird. Uh, there's one bird in the world that has iron-containing non-granular pigment that makes the green color. That's a taraco. But most often, green color is structural or a combination of yellow pigment and melanin, like in parrots. Okay, so it's either structural or kind of a combination of, of structure and chemical. All right, let's look at the other side, white. These feathers lack pigment and look white because the light of all wavelengths is scattered inside the pith of the rachis and the rami, the, the ramus. Albinism is not uncommon. There's lots of birds in the museum, you know, that are pure white, basically. So they lack the ability to make the melanin granules. Then we have blue. Blue is a structural color produced by the rami of the barbs, the central shaft of the barb. Okay, if you look at the, that central shaft and cross section, it's really interesting. The outer cortex is clear and the cells closest to the dorsal upper surface are filled with air vacuoles. The cells just beneath those have melanin pigment. So the vacuoles, the open bubbles basically, scatter blue light and the melanin absorbs all the light that makes it through. And the only the scattered light uh, that we see on the top side is, is visible. So a blue feather seen with transmitted light, you know, shown from below should look brown because most of the light will have been absorbed by the melanin before uh, reaching the vacuoles on top. Let me, and here's another photo showing light being reflected upward, melanin granules below absorbing the blue light. So the only way you're going to see the blue is from above as it's reflected back to you. Iridescent colors, the last one, these are produced by the barbules. So you have barb, right, and then the barbule. This is getting way down into the barbule. Color results from the interference of light waves by numerous overlapping platelets. So you have little platelets, little pancakes inside the barbules. Look at hummingbird feathers. This is amazing. Here's a picture uh, found on the web, and you can see little round dots. And the iridescence is produced by those platelets that reflect certain wavelengths of light. And the wavelength of light reflected is... Is, is related to the uh, diameter of those little platelets. And so hummingbirds are the ones that are the super iridescent feather champions. So here's a group of birds that, to show all these kinds of things. Cardinals with chemical pigments. Tanager there in the middle has all kinds of things. Chemical pigments, pigments. it has structural blues and greens. Mountain bluebirds are totally structural in color. Anna's hummingbird down the bottom right, structural iridescence. Peacock feather, lots of structural and iridescent chemical uh, characteristics. Mallards have chemical melanins and structural iridescence. Egret is totally white, lack of melanins, structural. And here's that weird turaco, which can produce actual green pigment called porphyrins. And that's basically it for coloration.